Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. We're a small group right now, at least. Maybe a few more will make it. The weather is... It's beautiful to have the rain. Yeah. And it's, it seems like a perfect rain for what we need. But boy, do we need to pray for all the people who are in the path of the storm and all the devastation and, and so on. I guess they said it was a... Uh, uh, what they say in, in the Carolinas, a storm of a thousand years, it, it, just the way it came through and, and all the flooding and de uh, devastation. So we have a lot of people to be praying for as well. But we're here, we're in God's presence, we are in the have the opportunity to worship him in spirit and in truth, and let's begin our time of worship now in prayer. Father, we come to you now, thank you so much for your goodness, for your kindness, for your love. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, through whom we come to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing on our time together. We ask your blessing on your people around the world and across the country as they come together, and especially we pray for those who have suffered damage and loss and even loss of life and family due to the devastation of this recent hurricane that even reached up to here. We ask that you would be with them. We ask for comfort. And we ask that the body of Christ would rally around them as well. We thank you that we can be here and ask your blessing and guidance now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together. Let's uh, worship our God in heaven. We're thanking him for allowing us this time to come together as the family of God and to praise his holy name. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those Gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are.
we long for you Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Nice to see you all. <laughs> I see you. I see you. Um, I have a just a couple of announcements today, a little um, perhaps change in plans with the rain. I'm going to look at Eileen here. With the rain, we can't really put the flyers out or they'll disintegrate. If you have... Uh, streets worth of plastic bags <laughs> you could put them in a plastic bag so I think uh, possibly let me correct me if this is not a good idea if you have plastic bags you're free to distribute to your street today if you don't you're free to take a street and revisit the neighborhood later on this week yes okay then um, Eileen's the woman to see to get your street and your flyers, and then you can pick a time that maybe isn't raining uh, later. Um, <clears throat> the sign up for the harvest party is still on the back table and it is still online. Those two things will be joined together this week so that we have a comprehensive view of everything that's going to be coming in and everybody who's helping. If you have signed up for the outdoor setup, then you should be here at 9.30. I'm looking out for confirmation. <laughs> 9.30? Yes? Okay, for outdoor setup. Yes, excellent. Tad says yes. Um, for indoor food setup, you don't have to be here quite so early. I don't think. Probably like quarter to 10, 10 o'clock. Um, so there's, there's that. <clears throat> uh, and then we have one update that we'll go into as long as there are no other announcement type items that I just don't have. Okay, let's take a moment in prayer then and we will get back to the music. Lord, Father in heaven, we are here today grateful for your presence in our lives, grateful for your 
guidance and, and help, that the Holy Spirit is with us and in us and helping us to provide for the people that we love and the people that we come in contact with. And sometimes it's hard to hear. Sometimes the, the noise from the world is a little loud. And it's hard to, to focus on what, you, what, you would, what you're trying to tell us and what you would have us do. So I ask this morning, Lord, my, my prayer is that you bring to us peace and calm so that we can hear your voice and that we can accept your guidance and strength as we go out in the world and, and interact with the people that we love and the people we come in contact with. And I ask that in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let's all stand together once again. And let's continue to, to sing to, to our God, a God who loves us so very much. And we know that he is with us in those times where we desperately need his help and times in which we're celebrating because we know that he is with us and holding on to us with a reckless love. For I spoke a word Sing it over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away.
be seated. At this time, we're going to continue our worship by uh, dedicating the offering that we've had the ability to be a part of. And we just ask that uh, the money that we have brought forth, the gifts, the prayers that we are offering to our God, that he would take them and that he would use them for his will as we dedicate the offering now to our Father. With rocks crowd to worship, whose glory taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing, but this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs. We magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption? Whose resurrection means I'll rise. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. But I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more.
Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Almighty Father, we just come before you as a group of people so thankful that you have uh, come into our lives, that you have taken charge of our lives, that you have given us the opportunity to come together and worship you together and to learn from you and to be taught by you and to be a part of what you're doing. Um, we are grateful for the talents, the abilities, the jobs, the opportunities, everything that you've given to us, we're thankful to you and we give all the credit to you. And we ask that you'll take what we have to give back to you in some small way and that you'll magnify it, that you'll make it bigger than we can imagine because you do things that are bigger than we can imagine. And we thank you for that. And so we just put this service in your hands, we put this offering in your hands and we put our lives in your hands and we thank you so much in Jesus name. Amen. Um, I do have the scripture reading that we'll go ahead and that I'll go ahead and read before the sermon today. Uh, this is from James 5, uh, verse 13 through 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways, of the error of their way, may save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And now we'll have a sermon brought to us by Mr. John Carlson. Good morning again. Well, today we're going to conclude our series of faith that works. We've been in the book or Paul, uh, James' letter to uh, Messianic Jews who had gone out into what they called the diaspora and to the Gentile nations gone out of, and these Messianics or fellow Christians we would call them today, they were a part of the Jerusalem congregation and then went forth. And so James, as the pastor of the Jerusalem congregation, is writing them this letter. And we've been going through it. In writing the letters, he, he's addressing for them the challenges and the struggles they face in their endeavor to live a Christ-honoring life in a, what we would call as Christians, an adversarial, adversarial society. Wherever they were going to go, the message they had was so countercultural to what everybody else was taught to believe. The emperor is God. The emperor is everything. The emperor is the son of God. The emperor is the Messiah, the one who's going to save everybody. And they're coming with a message, no, that's not right. Jesus is God. Jesus of Nazareth, they would probably say, to let them know where he was from, is the Son of God. He is our Messiah. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so they were facing many challenges from without and also struggles from within. Because all these folks that went out with this message were human beings, just like you and I are. And we have the same challenges. 
And we have many of the same struggles. And so the Holy Spirit realized that this letter it was a letter not just for them, but for anyone who would follow Jesus and inspire to have it put into his book. So we're at the end of this series. And in one way, we still have to figure out what was this series all about. One question, what is really the key to a, 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 a faith that works? He's talked about many different things and many different challenges and, 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 and good things and bad things and, and so on. Things you shouldn't be doing, things you should be doing. What's the key to it all? And even if you have the key, there's still this question. Because he hasn't gotten into it. Why did he write the letter to begin with? He's told them all these things, but why? Well, the title of the message today is The Key to a Faith that Works. At the end of his letter uh, to scattered Christians, James directs our attention to the focus of our faith, the thing that makes our faith meaningful and effective. And of course, uh, we've already had, read the passage, or uh, you know, we did because it was on the screen and Aaron read it for us in uh, James 5, 13 through 20. And so we'll be walking through that in the time that we have. In one way, it's very clear. Very easy to read. There isn't anything that he read there that I have a problem with, and I don't think any of you have a problem with. But it's not Finger Food Sunday, so there's not food out there, so we can stay longer and talk about it a little bit more. First of all, I think what we need to do is rethink the letter, or walk through the letter again. Because in this letter, James greets them in a special greeting, and then he begins to walk them through, as we would say, chapter by chapter, because it wasn't broken up into chapters in their day, but it has been for our, make it easier for us to go through it. And so as soon as he greets them, then he talks about rejoice when you have trials and temptations and things are difficult and so on, because it's going to develop your character and develop your faith and give you a living faith, a faith that works. And then he says, so the first thing you've got to think about is don't just listen to what's being said. Don't just read. You've got to do it. You've got to be active. Faith must be active. Then he goes on in what we would call chapter 2 and says, now here's another thing. You've got to put aside all these biases that you have toward people who are different because everybody is going to be different out there. And the thing is, not, you're not just dealing with one false religion. All religions were allowed in, in the Roman Empire as long as the emperor was on top. And so there's going to be a, a, a struggle from all sides, but it's not us and them. So no favoritism if you're going to make it. And that means it's not just a matter of belief. You have faith in Christ, that's marvelous. But faith without deeds or works that makes a difference in your life is no real faith at all. Because true faith, living faith, a faith that works, is going to be a faith that works. And in addition, he writes, you're going out, you're being sent out to make disciples, is the term his brother Jesus used, to teach people, in other words, to teach about him, to teach of his ways, to teach his commandments, to teach what he taught. But don't necessarily think just because you're sent out to teach that you can say anything you want to say. You've got to learn, because none of you are able to do this, 
James probably wasn't either, but it's easier to write it than to say it. You've got to learn to tame the tongue. As we all do as well. And that means you've got to really, to be able to do that, to be able to make a true difference, you've got to live wisely. You've got to live a good life, an upright life, with the wisdom that comes from humility. You see, there's fake wisdom, and there's true wisdom. There's worldly wisdom, or they were sent out as world's uh, sheep among wolves, so you could call them, as we, we did, wolf wisdom. And then there's shepherd's wisdom. You've got to choose that and learn to live that way. Which means you've got to resist the source of the fake wisdom, which is the devil, and submit to God. Draw close to God. He's going to draw close to you. Then you're going to be able to make progress. But you know, there's another thing. Don't go off saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to do this, and next week I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to do such and such. Don't go boasting about what you're going to do tomorrow, because you, you, your life is like a, a vapor. It's here for a little bit, and then it vanishes away. Like steam out of the tea kettle. So don't boast about tomorrow. Say, if God wills, then I'll do this and I'll do that. I don't know how you folks are. I never used to say, God willing. But you know, over the years, now, when I leave for work, in the morning, I say goodbye to the rest of the family, you know, Cody and Whiskey. <laughs> and they say, I'll be back soon. As they stand at the door, God willing. That comes to my mind automatically now because suddenly I realize I don't know how much more time I have. It's in his hands. And then he said, for those of you who are well-to-do, who are well off, comparatively speaking, who have all that you need and so on, and you have people coming to work for you who just don't have all that, don't oppress them. Warren's the rich oppressors, he calls them. Boy, I'd hate to be a church member and be called, oh, you're a rich oppressor. <laughs> Apparently, they had that issue. And I think in the church today, we see that sometimes as well. And then he said, this is in chapter 5, be patient. Don't lose patience in suffering. Don't give up. And then make sure whatever you say, if you want to really demonstrate, you know, oh, you're right in this. Don't call on God to say to, to kind of stand and say, yeah, yeah he, he or she is all right and everything, and what they say is right. Don't go promising things and then having to say, oh, uh, God, as God is my witness, this and that and the other thing. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then at the end of this letter, the last few what we would call verses, he comes to the key of all of this. What was all of this all about? What was he trying to bring out in this letter? Not just a bunch of do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, honors and shames type of thing, but how to live that life of wisdom expressed through humility. And so we come to the power of prayer. Now, in reality, as we look at this, and we will right now, if I get to it and get over this first part, but this part I think is so important because it's us. They are us. He comes now, and the whole thing has been about prayer the whole time. We shall see. Chapter 5, verse 13, as we begin, he first he says, Is any among you in trouble? Let them pray. 
Now, really what he's doing is he's, he's uh, reiterating, uh, reviewing, summarizing, go, going over the key points of the letter. Because the first thing he wrote in ch chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, he said, Consider it pure, it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So perseverance, don't lose patience. Rejoice in the trial. This is going to enable you so that you won't lose patience and give up as when it really get, the going gets tough. But if any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God. Now, there's a four-letter word that we use for that. What is it? Pray. So he's, at the end of the letter, he's going back and saying, this is it. This is the beginning of the whole thing. This is where you start. This is the focus. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. That wisdom that expresses itself in humility that he talked about, you can have it. And if you have that humility, you're looking to God, you're trusting in him, you're relying on him, you're waiting on him. And he will empower you to do whatever he's called you to do where he, wherever he sends you. And enable you to endure whatever you need to do, endure and to persevere. However, or but, when you ask... You must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So in other words, a faith that works is a faith where I can go to him, I ask him for wisdom, and I know he's going to give it to me as I listen and as I humbly follow what he shows me. So if any of you are in trouble, pray. Then he carries on in the second half of the verse, verse 13. We go back in James 5. And he says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Now what does that mean? Pray through music. Reflect on God's deeds and what all, all the things he has done. That's what we've just been doing now, isn't it? And we didn't, we don't, didn't have the time because you guys all want to leave and eat, so we can't do a thousand hallelujahs all today. But that is the object of the game where we look, we realize, yes, he is providing because, as he said, as James wrote in chat, back in chapter 1, after he said, you know, pray and, and ask God for wisdom and so on. Then in verse 16, he said, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. You are blessed in a very special way. So every day when the sun comes up and there's light and, and, and so on and, and all the things around you that are good that God gives you because everything that is good comes from him. Not from the emperor. Not from the president. But comes from him. So it wouldn't hurt to start out the day with a song. You might get 500 hallelujahs done before you go off to work. I read uh, something about the important relationship between music and memory. I'd like to read that to you right now. Most of us would agree, as a matter of fact, yeah, most of us would agree that singing worship songs in our gatherings is important. But do we realize just how important these songs are to our growth as believers? In a New York Times article entitled, 
in one ear and out the other, Natalie Angier examines the limited power of human memory. She points out that while we can't quite seem to remember the birthday of a beloved one, we can't quite forget every, sing every word of the Gilligan's Island theme song. Why is that? It seems that all you add, uh, that if you add a little music to something, it's more likely to be remembered. That's how the brain is wired to work. Though scientists used to believe that short and long-term memories were stored in the different parts of the brain, they have discovered that what really distinguishes the lasting from the transient is not how is how strongly the memory is engraved in the brain. That's what makes the difference. How strong does it get hammered in? The process of memory formation by neuronal entrainment helps explain why none of life's offering, uh, offerings weasel in easily and then refuse to be spiked. Music, for example. Quote, the brain has a strong propensity to organize information and perception in patterns. And music plays into that inclination, said Michael Thout, the professor of music and neuroscience at Colorado State University. A simple melody with a simple rhythm and repetition, repetition can be a tremendous mnemonic device. It would be a virtual, it would be a virtual virtually impo impossible task for our young children to memorize a sequence of 26 separate letters if you just gave it to them as a string of information, Dr. Thout said. But when the alphabet is set to the tune of the ABC song with f its four melodic phases, preschoolers can learn it with ease. And I wouldn't be surprised if we started singing it, you could all sing it as well. In other words, the hymns or choruses we sing, which combine scriptural truths with moving melodies, teach us things that won't easily be forgotten. That should probably give us pause, pause to reflect that the value of what we have in the hymnals tucked away in our pews, pause to re revisit what is being projected on the screens, uh, that line in the front of our worship auditoriums, pause to remember that God has given us a powerful tool in music and its potent relationship to human memory. You know, it's something. I mean, I've talked about it before. Maybe many of you have had the same thing happen. Something is going on, and all of a sudden, a song comes to mind. A hymn, if you grew up on hymns, a praise song, songs like we've sung today, and all of a sudden it's there. I had something happen to me this week. I can't really tell you what it was because I forgot, but <laughs> I know part of it. And that is, it was Thursday, I think, and I'm working on this, and all of a sudden, this song comes to my mind. It was a song when I was growing up as a kid. We were in the Baptist church. My sister is older than me. She had a gift that I don't have that she could sing, and she was singing a solo in church of an old Baptist song that I had never, I don't think I'd ever heard it since left home, and all of a sudden there I was, even the words. And if I would have been speaking five minutes ago and it happened, I could tell you what the song was. But <laughs> all of a sudden, it's gone again. I was going to go talk to my sister about it this week, and I can't remember the song now, so it doesn't do me any good. But what it does do, it helps me to see again the truth of this, how important the music is that we sing every week. Even if you're not a musical person, listen to those, the rhythm, read, read those words. The words will come. Uh, listen to the singing and then try to sing along. Might invent an additional harmony, that's okay. But they do make a difference. So if 
things are good and you're happy and you're blessed. And thank God through song. That lasts a lot longer than just saying thanks. Then we go down to verse 14. Is anyone sick? So now he's talking about personal areas where we often need to learn to do something that we don't necessarily always do well. We don't like to ask for help quite often. And often we will go through things and, and, and suffer on our own. I'm that way too. That's why I can say we. I would much rather say you. But... <laughs> And yet he says here, no matter what it is, and he, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the, for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer uh, offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Well, there's a lot to talk about in this that we don't have time for right now. But basically, the whole concept of Oil, which is symbolic of the, the, the healing power of the Holy Spirit. Oil was used back in, in the day as well as, as one of their medicinal uses. And so the, the minister, the, the pastor, the, the elder would come and pray over them and also use a physical uh, sign of healing. That was the medicine of the day. But the healer is God. Here's an example that I read that I think can help us to understand how this works and what's important. It's from Ed Dobson in Seeing Through a Fog, which is a, a, an article he wrote, or a book he actually wrote before he passed. In the fall of 2000, doctors diagnosed Pastor Ed Dobson with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, an incurable and fatal disease. The doctors gave him two to five years to live and predicted that he would spend most of that time in a disabled condition. Shortly after he was diagnosed, Ed wanted someone to anoint him with oil and pray for healing. And he wanted someone to pray who really believed in healing. Don't just go through the motions. So Ed invited a friend, a Pentecostal pastor, who had regular healing services to come over and pray for him. Here's how Ed described what happened. It was one of the most, re most moving evenings of my entire life. He began by telling of stories of people he had prayed for who were miraculously healed. He also told stories about people he had prayed for who were not healed and had passed away receiving that ultimate and final healing. Before he prayed for me, he gave me some advice. Don't become obsessed with getting healed, Ed, he said. If you get obsessed with getting healed, you will lose your focus. Get lost in the wonder of God. Who, know, who knows what he will do for you? Get lost in the wonder of God. If you're in trouble, look to God. Get lost in his wonder. Things go well, Sing praises and get lost in the wonder of God. If you need help in anything, ask for help. But get lost in the wonder of God. Who knows what he may do for you? It goes on to say, this is some of the best advice I have ever received. Since that night, I've been trying to get and stay lost in the wonder of God. I think that's what James is getting at in all of this. That's why he says, no matter what's going on, pray. Pray in a certain way, in certain situations, in another way, in other situations. Get help if you need to so that others are praying as well. As he goes on to say, or to write in verse, beginning in our verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on land or for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, 
they are happy outside as we see the rain coming down and the grass is beginning to come back, at least starting to, and so on. And, and we just had a drought for a few, I don't even think we could say months, a couple of months and, and, you know, and a few weeks, three years. And God says, you pray and, and stop that. We got to get their attention. And three years later, then Elijah prays because he believed what God said would happen. And they have rain. The fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. See the article up there that just got flipped on? We're going to read that. A little bit longer, but these are the type of things that do happen. May not happen to you, may happen to you at some time. Talk about a woman in a coma, here's the prayers of her recovery, for her recovery. Linda was filled not by one, but two brain aneurysms. For weeks, she lingered on life support, growing weaker each day. At her as her condition deteriorated, her children were called to say th their goodbyes, and her church prepared for a funeral. Then Linda suddenly snapped out of her coma. As she came to, she looked over at her husband and asked, where is everybody else? Shaking his head, he explained, they only allow one of us at a time in the ICU. There is no one else here. Linda argued, no, I heard them. They were all speaking at the same time, and there were hundreds of them, too. Some of them I knew, others I didn't, but they were all around me. They were here. Linda's husband assured her, that all those people had never been in the room. Like many, he initially thought that Linda must have been hallucinating. Some people speculated that Linda had seen and heard angels. But the real answer was probably much closer to home. A few days after her miraculous recovery, Linda discovered that a large prayer chain had been created to pray for her. It affected fervent prayer. This group had been formed when news of her condition was sent to, out to local churches, and then it had spread to other groups throughout the region. Within days, Linda's name had been placed on hundreds of prayer lists and written in scores of prayer logs. For weeks, thousands were praying for her each day. Her miraculous recovery convinced Linda of two things. The voices she heard were of the people who had been praying for her, and those prayers had pulled her back from death's door. Linda's story is far from unusual. This is important for us to understand. Countless people have been touched by the power of prayer. Science and personal experiences have proven that the words of prayer do have impact. But that impact can't happen unless the ones doing the praying believe their words carry weight. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. Well, the key to living, uh, having a faith that works totally is focusing on God and the key to that is prayer. However, we still don't know why he wrote the letter. And it comes down to the very last verse. Only in the last verse do we get an idea what the letter is all about. The bottom line for them and the bottom line for us. Verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. He's writing them and saying, you're out, you're out there, you're, there, there's adversarial, in an adversarial situation, challenges, trials, difficulties, you have a lot going on in your own lives. Look out for one another. Keep your eye on one another. Be there for one another. 
In Christianity today, there is a, a, a um, was a, a, a saying, or not a saying, but a contribution by a man named Gilbert Beers in an article, Joy Is. This is what he wrote. Error is the inevitable consequence of living. Mutual error is the inevitable consequence of living together. Argument or fault finding is the defensive mechanism to preserve an ego in trouble. Confession is the sacrifice of ego at the altar of love. Forgiveness is the balm of healing that soothes and heals the wounds of error. Joy is the fresh new path stretching out before the forgiver and the forgiven. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. He's saying, and the Holy Spirit saying through him to all of us, here in this room and in our congregation, and to all those that we know, look out for one another. Care for one another. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now and thank you so much that we can. Thank you that we've been able to be here together. Thank you for the love that you have shown us. We ask your blessing now as we go forth from here. Help us to remember the importance of putting you first in everything and getting lost in the love of you and lost in your goodness. We ask that you would be with us now. Bless us this week that we may bring honor and glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together once again for our final song. sunset sky of my one request Lord my only aim is that you reign in me again Lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am so won't you reign in me darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again, Lord reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again. day, for blessing us with this message, for blessing us with the, the knowledge that we can connect with you in such a powerful way through prayer. 
We just ask now that you would protect us, that you would help us through this week, always remembering, helping us to remember that we can rely on you. Uh, and just may we immerse ourselves more and more in that relationship that is brought through prayer. We thank you. We give you glory and honor and ask for your protection in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>